it is my great pleasure to invite dr rahul tambe she is from nanoti hospital and and uh, dr tambe is a physician a consulting physician and uh, thank you so for coming uh, he also is an avid teacher loves teaching he has, he has dnb students under him and we are going to take advantage of him more and more we are going to talk on adverse drug reactions of anti diabetic drugs so you take this mic i'll take that i'll i'll take that sorry so good morning everybody so do you know why tusha dr tusha yeah, sir actually uh, conducts these lectures any anybody <laughs> so what is his 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 motive <laughs> okay so this is something which was told to me by my teacher now what happens is that when you start giving lectures or disseminating knowledge you actually have to read a lot to teach so the first sessions who did very badly with the adverse drug reactions we did not feel bad because i also did not do so well i was actually not prepared to the question of there and i think i probably would not have made through it so well so the biggest advantage of coming here i mean at least it's my uh, what do you call that advantage or why i want it is that when you start giving lectures or teaching you actually start learning so much more you know because you have to prepare and you are so scared that something somebody will come from the audience and ask you and you will not know so that's part of it so medicine is so vast that i'm sure that you just can't remember all the ideas you can't remember all the uh cy 450 interactions is just impossible but thing is that it gives you an awareness that there is a possibility that this is there and that we should probably look in the google to see for drug reaction and one more thing i like about it because i always say biggest problem with us is that we are just not aware of the drug reactions and if you are going to give a medicine if it's not going to work it's absolutely worthless and third thing one of my bosses told if you are going to give more than two drugs for anything then be sure that you are looking for cross reactions drug interactions and that's very important thank you yeah thank you raul and uh, yeah he as he said rightly i don't come here i don't come here for you okay so be aware <laughs> of that okay we are discussing anti diabetic drugs and their adverse drug reactions and uh, may we have the first slide please uh the first drug of course we will discuss is metformin and uh, the adverse drug reactions of course uh, metformin is the first choice drug for most patients of uh, this which patient will you not start with metformin start with something else so very important if you look uh, metformin is the one which is which is approved for almost every indication including type 1 so they say that diabetic patient has to be on metformin so only if you have bad uh, uh, i mean you have you are looking at some contraindication then only this patient cannot have been on metformin so one is of course kidneys you know so if you are a patient who is either crf or who has a creatinine clearance which is less than 45 then that's the kind of patients who will be on met not on metformin otherwise i can't find any other indications why patient should not be on metformin how often do you have to stop or reduce dose due to gi side effects yeah pretty often so the problem with metformin is gi side effects it's known to cause uh, flatulence it's known to cause diarrhea uh, so they the technology over a period of time improved so you had those micro technology where the drug is slowly released so it did reduce some amount of gi side effects the other issue is that we never stop start metformin at 2 grams a day you know so it better that you start a smaller dose then increasing but anything more than 1.5 gram patient are known to have side effects another common side effect is what is known as a ghost tablet if you are aware so the patient will say that the tablet just came out passing of stool but actually it's not the tablet it's just the encasing which uh, comes intact but yes gi tolerance is a big problem with metformin okay uh, and there is this mention of b12 deficiency due to metformin yeah so long term effect uh, is associated with b12 deficiency obviously but uh, often you know you should be also uh, aware what kind of people who are more prone to be a basic b12 deficiency so people who you know b12 actually comes from uh, 
non vegetarian food so it's the egg yolk which is the biggest source and meat so probably jains who consume very little amount of that oh, sorry they don't consume anything they are the one who are more chances of getting b12 deficiency especially with metformin would you give every patient of metformin a b12 supplement uh not necessary if you have adequate amount of b we don't usually measure b12 level but yes uh if the patient we suspect b12 deficiency we do recommend uh, using b12 an uh, interesting point here is that often people who are long standing diabetic have sensory neuropathy so sometimes you might have an issue that you 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 actually attributed to more of diabetic uh, uh, polyneuropathy and you miss out on the fact that these patient may be actually having b12 deficiency because of diabetes per se their dietary habits and metformin compounding that's an interesting mind. point yeah so uh okay you said use in ckd below gfr of 45 may be a contraindication uh the, in our school uh, college days we used to have lactic acid acidosis as the principal side effect i have personally never seen a case of lactic acidosis so, uh, okay so lactic still a controversial issue very difficult to say that metformin is actually the one which is a culprit but definitely what we do know is that metformin when used in congestive heart attack failure acute myocardial infection ckd hepatic failure have increased chances of pushing the patient into lactic acidosis there's no doubt about that i have only seen one patient who was in cardiac failure and was on 2 grams of metformin so it's difficult to attribute really that this patient actually went into lactic acidosis but yes so that's one reason why patients who have a acute coronary disease or a cardiac failure or the patient who's going for a cat is not the right drug to continue at least at that period of time having spoken about cat uh, contrast media we are usually advised to stop before etc what is the Okay, again a controversial issue, I think. Uh, but uh, by and large, because we, because uh, you know, those patients who actually need CAT probably have a, if they have a coronary artery disease, then we believe that diabetes was there for ten years. So usually, metformin and along with that, large number of medications or insulin will be there. So it is better that you withdraw medicines. I mean, withdraw metformin. Also, not to forget that these patients are also on ACE inhibitors. So. they found that both metformin as well as ace inhibitor when they undergo cath or any contrast related procedure they have increased incidence of contrast related nephropathy so we we usually tell them to omit the drug prior to the day of uh, cath and then probably they can restart after 48 hours this is a very important message to the family physician because many patients will go on on in and out patient uh, status to either a ct ct angiography or a ct scan for some any other purpose or a cath a cardiac catheterization uh, you must look at the drug list and as he said ac inhibitors arbs and metformin may create a problem do the baseline creatinine of course but even if the creatinine is normal you might have to withdraw metformin 48 hours prior start 48 hours after the cath so one second only yeah. one re- another thing you re- important that when you see a normal creatinine two things you should always look what's the range and is the creatinine on the higher side of normal persistently you have to understand that creatinine goes above the normal range only when there is 50% reduction in the renal function so these patient who are already on borderline you know a small contrast i mean small contrast in the sense if you are doing a cath it's a large contrast and with metformin it just pushes the patient into a renal injury and another thing is that creatinine will usually rise after 48 hours so we often believe that the patient is okay but no just wait for 48 hours you do a creatinine and you will find the creatinine is increasing that's another very important point for the family physician patient has done an opd procedure with contrast media and had a borderline creatinine do repeat the patient's creatinine 48 to 72 hours after the procedure and you can see whether there is any significant rise in the creatinine a 25% rise in creatinine would be considered a significant rise any uh, we we'll just take one question with every every group of drugs any question on metformin a patient will have uh, sweating patient will have breathlessness tachycardia tachypnea and then subsequently in severe lactic acidosis you will have hypotension so look for unexplained tachycardia sweating breathlessness hyperventilation he'll ta- he'll be tachypneic that will be the first thing i would like to look for and only in the later stage you will find that the patient start having hypotension we'll go to the next slide suraj will uh yeah so more than 60 you are okay with it so they say anywhere between 45 to 60 they don't say reduce the dose they say that you look uh, you monitor the renal function 
between 30 to 45 you actually can't give more than 1.5 gram below 30 they don't recommend it or if it's absolutely necessary then it's not more than uh, 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 one gram and you have to look at the renal functions very well okay and the other thing is that is gfr okay it's never creatinine so just be because gfr changes with age yeah so metformin was the first oha which is approved in pregnancy it's not an issue with that sorry so both of them are different so if you have if you are using metformin in pregnancy and if your creatinine levels are higher side i would be first of all worried why the creatinine is on the higher side and metformin in pregnancy is basically uh, given uh, so it's probably i believe you're talking about gestational diabetes so there i don't actually expect the patient to have nephropathy which takes uh, about 8 to 10 years after getting the diabetes but patient has a nephropathy from some other reason and you are pregnant metformin is not the one i'd look for i'll just stick to insulin for this patient we'll go on to uh... no no as he said normally we don't normally we don't okay we'll go on we'll take only one question at a time if possible uh we talked about sulfonylurea. Sulfonylurea, as you know, are a group of drugs that is going out of fashion uh, uh, because of the so many other groups that have come. But for us Indians, it's still they're, they're very still uh, they're still very important. So, what is the place in terms of adverse drug reactions in your practice of sulfonylurea? Do so, they come second after metformin? So, uh, first of all, fantastic drug in the sense that it is really a poor man's good anti-diabetic drug. If you remember, Dianil in 85 was sold at 5 paisa and 10 years back it was sold at 50 paisa. It's the cheapest drug you can get. Fantastic drug. From a professional point of view, if you want to make the patient very happy, sulfonylurea is the drug because it gives you an immediate fall in blood glucose level. But what happened with sulfonylurea is again with these reactions. Hypoglycemia is very common with sulfonylurea. The issue there is that you need to know which among the sulfonylurea gives you a problem. So long-acting one, which is glibinclamide, uh, are the one which is more likely to give hypoglycemic, more so in the elderly who have erratic food. That is one part. Stick to short-acting drugs, you know, such as glycoside or glipizide. The chances of hypoglycemia is much less. About weight gain, are you bothered by weight gain? First of all, sulfonylurea. So uh, uh, you do. You we do know that uh, uh, metformin and your uh, newer HGLT2 are more weight neutral or weight reducing versus sulfonylureas. But as compared to pyoglutazone, it's okay. So I'll be not very much worried of sulfonylureas considering the other benefits of sulfonylurea, unless patient has the issue with. Uh, Within sulfonylureas, we have four sulfonylureas commonly used, glipizide, glibenclamide, glicloside, glimepiride. Within these four, do you choose any one more than the other in, say, renal patients, cardiac patients? Yeah, so again, uh, in elderly patients, long-acting sulfonylureas, glibenclamide is out of my armamentarium now. I think, I don't know, I, I'm not using it. I'll just prefer one is your uh, glipizide, glicloside, which are short-acting. Even the newer sulfonylureas, glimepiride is short-acting, that's one. And if you have a myocardial infarction, cardiac infarction, so you're looking at a cardiovascular safety, uh, then glicloside is the one which has the uh, best of the uh, CV safety. So they are the drugs which I would use if the patient has coronary artery disease. Patients who are in renal failure, obviously you don't want to give long-acting uh, medications such as glibenclamide because of uh, accumulation of the drug. I'll still stick to a... Uh, uh, short acting does maybe a glimepiride or a glipizide would be a right drug for me. Another thing that the family physicians often or any physician often does not do is de-prescribe de sulfonylurea. As we know, as years progress of diabetes, the pancreatic insulin reserve goes less and sulfonylureas are basically secretagogues which push insulin out. Uh, would you de-prescribe gradually after some years of diabetes? So, if you see the uh, uh, ADA guidelines, sulfonylureas are now really going at the bottom of the table because of the safety, the hypoglycemic events, and uh, again, uh, with as he said, so in long-acting patients, it, it's basically a secretocoque. So, uh, over a period of time, the beta cells are going to be exhausted, and then pushing the already exhausted beta cell to squeeze in more insulin just doesn't work up. So, I would not be using sulfonylurea. I think after 10 years, probably 10 to 15 years, I am sure sulfonylurea ureas will be the least prescribed oral antibiotic, only oral antidiabetic agent. As he said rightly, that though they are very effective, they are also going out of fashion. And uh, of course, the reason is a greater 
choices, number of choices available of, self, of anti-diabetics. Can we go to the next slide, please? DPP-4 inhibitors are becoming very popular. As you know, the, there are several DPP-4, sitagliptin, lenagliptin, teneligliptin, saxagliptin, vildagliptin, are DPP-4 inhibitors. Uh, about, there's one warning given with DPP-4 of increased incidence of infections. I have never seen, but uh, how do you... Okay, uh, uh, I think uh, I just read it last night regarding what's really the incidence of UORT. I think they have put it as less than 1%, but technically, yes, there's a possibility. It's more so because diabetic patients are prone to infections. But uh, frankly speaking, I have not ever been linked, uh, able to link a patient who developed UORT to DPP-4 inhibitors. I am not too worried about it. Okay. Uh, another thing that is mentioned is Patients with history of pancreatitis should def definitely not be given GLP-1 injectable analogs, that is. But even DPP-4 inhibitors, whether they should be avoided in any patient who is given history of pancreatitis due to any cause. Do you, do you, would you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, so with DPP-4, the issue is again, I think, pancreatitis. So I, I, I would not use that kind of a drug if it is already there. If there is any past history of yes, pancreatitis. Yes, yes. Otherwise, yes. Otherwise, of course, you can use it. But... The, it's not a red, I mean, black box warning that you can't use it. But if you have a history, I would not use it definitely. You would avoid it for... Absolutely. Okay. Uh, as you already said, DPP-4 inhibitors are weight neutral. They don't cause weight loss. They're weight neutral. They are hypoglycemia is uncommon. Uh, and we just spoke about saxagliptin and its um, uh, drug uh, CYP-related interaction. The only C, uh, DPP-4 which has... Uh, any questions on DPP-4? I'll Anybody? just add one yeah. thing. All the DPP-4, they are different in yeah, terms sorry. of their metabolism. So, uh, for, I'll just, I don't want to go too deep. So, some of them are uh, excreted to the liver. Some of them are kidneys. Some of them are excreted 50% liver, 50% kidneys. So, you need to choose a drug if you have liver issues and kidney issues. We are very well aware that in renal issues, we are sticking to uh, lenagliptin and now you have the tenagliptin. But otherwise, you will be careful. If you have a hepatic dysfunction, then uh, your, I think, uh, Vildagliptin, yes. So, Vildagliptin, I would not like to give in. So, before you, you need to choose uh, which one you want to give. And I agree with him. One thing is that Sexa probably has the uh, worst amount of side effect profile or ADRs or whatever. So, I would not be, uh, that would not be keen on putting that drug in my. Yeah, so, uh, would you agree uh, that in a patient with renal failure, your first choice would be the costlier lena or would it be the cheaper tenagliptin? Oh, so the only difference is, is as far as still till about say about a couple of months, but with the CV safety with lenagliptin was already proved. And I think tenagliptin ka CV safety was an issue which I think they tried to clear it about a couple of months back. I have not gone through the data. If I would still stick to the lenagliptin. Unless, if the patient has no coronary artery disease and you are not looking at CV safety, etc., then probably I am okay with uh, tenagliptin because it is cheaper, that's all. We'll take one more question. Yeah. No, weight neutral is not an adverse drug reaction. Weight neutral is just a state because all the anti-diabetic drugs have either weight gain or weight loss. But some are weight neutral. So, no adverse drug reaction in that sense. We have put it as a point because we are, we are already 55, 56 year old. So, we just want to remember what points to cover. Next slide, please. He is asking if DPP4 has cardiovascular risk and mortality no. increase. Oh, no. So, Yes, yes, I agree with it. That there they found to have slight increase in mortality, uh, cardiovascular mortality per se. But uh, rest of the thing they did found with citagliptin, they were okay with it. So, CV safety was okay with it. CV safety good with liragliptin also. Tenagliptin, they have not yet come with the CV safety record. Yeah, but uh, saxagliptin, we have already decided, right, that uh, it's not called on glyza anymore, it's called off glyza. <laughs> Next slide, please. SGLT2 inhibitors. As you know, SGLT2, the common ones that are available in uh, India are canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin. Uh, they increase uh, glucosuria, uh, eliminate glucose via the urinary tract. And uh, 
your opinion on the urogenital infection rate and whether it is a limiting factor in our prescription so probably my experience my experience uncontrolled grossly uncontrolled diabetes who have as it is an increased propensity for infection you know so if you are going to use a drug you should be sure that the patient does not have uti does not have fungal infections uh they have listed another important uh, infection in the males that is fornia's gangrene or necrotizing fasciitis i have never come across that part with your sgt2 inhibitors but yes those patients who have uti i would not use LG, uh, sglt2 as of now so it's going to be no no but if the patient does not have uti and you start do you see a lot of patients with who come back with fungal infection so i would like to wait i would like to cure the fungal infection and then so so, these, so it's a good question so those who come back with fungal infections and who are on sglt2 my experience is that they have an uncontrolled sugar causing the infection yes it's not the prima facie that is a sglt2 of course sglt2 is the contributing factor there's no doubt about it because that's the mechanism you know Okay. passing of large amount of glucose in urine so they are bound to it so i would like to stop till then and then probably get back to do sglt2 inhibitors they are wonderful drugs i believe uh weight loss is supposed to be a positive side effect of sglt2 in your experience significant Fan- loss fantastic fantastic, fantastic. Okay. is only ohas which can give you uh i'll just beg to differ among the among the uh, sglt2 empagliflozin has the best uh, data on weight loss so you can lose as much as 2 to 3 kg in a period of 6 months so uh, they are uh, one one drug where i can tell you that the patient will lose weight because of uh, empagliflozin is uh, these uh, group of drugs i have been very happy regarding the weight loss for this patient empagliflozin was also the first drug that came first sglt2 that came out with cardiovascular benefit profile yes 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 okay uh the thing that we are asked to take care of in patients on sglt2 is uh a dehydration and sometimes ketoacidosis so is that something that you would warn the patient about would you educate the patient something yeah so we do tell them uh ki uh, i think another is hyponatremia i believe I didn't so write that, okay. we 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 do we do give instructions to this patient or we monitor we monitor at least actually for hyponatremia that is one part of it and that we make them aware they have more episodes of sometimes postural hypotension giddiness and falls so we do educate these patients that you need to be very careful or in in case of uh, any signs of dehydration or they have decreased fluid intake then they would like that they report us back to us so we had these patients who had hyponatremia we had patients with recurrent falls and really uh, it's not so uncommon but especially in the elderly i would be worried about that where you know intake of fluid is often less for these patients in terms of gfr what would you say the role of sglt2 in low gfr patients i think uh, as of now with low gfr uh, uh, it's contraindicated so would not be I, i don't know the cut off i think the cut off is 45 i suppose so, so with less than 45 i would not be using sglt2 inhibitors any other thing in which i have missed here as the bullet so again uh, i think uh, the ada guidelines are now approved is as second line drug i suppose i think it is going to be as a first line drug also it's very good uh, two places uh, it's not been approved is one is type 1 diabetic and then patients with diabetic ketoacidosis so these are the only contraindications there otherwise they have also known to reduce the amount of insulin when patients of type 2 diabetes are on oh plus insulin so i am very uh, positive and especially with obese patients who have difficulty in losing weight they probably are a better drug of choice yeah she is yeah. asking if patient is on diuretic yeah because the mechanism is that it causes increased excretion of glucose now glucose is a um, uh, osmotic molecule so it pulls in fluid along with it so dehydration becomes is uh, uh, a problem with it along with fluid there's some loss of sodium so hyponatremia is again a issue with it so you need to be a little bit careful especially in the elderly often they have a marginal sodium about say about 134 136 and when you put this sglt2 they will have dehydration low sodium and then you will have disorientation falls i think uh, i have not talked about the fracture risk you know but so one reason why do they they actually have fracture they found is because hyponatremia leading to uh, recurrent falls and that's why the incidence of fractures was slightly higher in sglt2 inhibitors
sorry she is asking uh, if it is the action is not related to insulin mm. why should you not use this drug in diabetic because uh, in type 1 diabetics because you still need insulin some amount to have to reduce the blood sugar level so this here it's only able to excrete whatever is there but if so you why not combine no insulin, with insulin the answer is that uh, it causes ketoacidosis, ketoacidosis much more so commonly in type 1 diabetics. diabetics so that's what we said one of the problem issues is ketoacidosis so because the pathway is blocked there these patients are more prone for ketoacidosis and that's why it's very important that you don't use it with insulin one important common clinical situation that you people will face i face is that if you are if our patient is on metformin and sglt2 and the patient gets acute gastroenteritis due to any infection diarrhea and vomiting do you omit both if the sugar is 300 what do you do you must omit metformin and sglt2 you must omit you might give transiently insulin if you like but do not continue these two drugs even if the sugars are high of course if the sugars are low with gastroenteritis you will omit everything and i'm just trying to say that do not hesitate to stop metformin which will continue to worsen the gastroenteritis and hesitate to stop sgld2 okay uh, anything else in sgld2 that uh, i'll just the risk of the supposed increased risk of amputation of canal i think the uh, risk of amputation was uh, more with canal glucosin i think they had said empa was much safer so in general empa is much safer canal glucosin had increased incidence of amputation what he is talking about is the that canal glucosin there came a warning with canal glucosin that increased risk of limb amputation in patients with peripheral vascular disease if they are on canal glucosin however later studies have rebutted those studies and currently the status is probably canagliflozin is not unsafe in that respect is but you know how pharma companies will kind of produce papers which will uh, reverse the previous but uh, i think as he said empa with its current uh, best safety profile especially the benefits on cardiovascular system uh, i use empa glyflozin like he does and uh, it's our first choice i will just mention two sure. bits of my uh, experience is that in my experience sglt2 inhibitors cause bothersome recurrent fungal infections in at least 50% of my patients which necessitates their stoppage so for me though they are beautiful drugs i cannot continue them even after giving them antifungals and restarting they come back so that is something of course we must teach them hygiene but that is something that i don't know whether it will be a uh, rate limiting factor so to speak of prescribing sglt2 inhibitors uh can we go to the next bioglitazone how do you like it do you like it you don't like it oh um, I, actually i love the drug Who you love the drug okay i love the drug uh for one reason again in uh, from business end point of view from giving immediate uh, reduction in fasting and ppbs pyoglitazone are wonderful drugs um, patient will stick to you if you add pyoglitazone so short term wise it's a excellent drug also you can titrate it very well you can go as much as to 45 mg so uh, dose related efficacy is much better and it's much quicker with pyoglitazone uh pyoglitazone my most worry is that you need to stop it with patients who are fluid overloaded patient who had lvf uh in immediate palm nyha class 2 is contraindications for using pyoglitazone by patients who had had coronary artery disease it has to be stopped so we find that patient is on pyoglitazone for long term undergoes angioplasty had cardiac failures and still patient is on pyoglitazone so that's a big no no another uh, uh, problem is weight gain but this again i'll ask to tushar i feel that it's more with females i, I have no preponderance from that perspective but my uh, my uh, experience is that females who they have no coronary artery they are not um, not fluid overloaded but these when put on pyoglitazone can put as much as 2 to 3 kgs after one year so uh, that's my personal observation so weight gain is a big problem with pyoglitazone correct uh, uh pyoglitazone as he said is very important that even if there is a slightly subnormal ejection fraction that is systolic dysfunction you should not use pyoglitazone that is a must and of course weight gain is a problem uh, 
i principally mean since as you know bioglitazone and metformin are the two insulin sensitizers meaning they reduce the resistance uh, of insulin so my use of pyrotizone increases in patients who don't tolerate metformin because if you don't give any insulin sensitizer in type 2 diabetes the diabetes is not going to get easily controlled so in such patients definitely who have neither tolerate or no, not tolerated metformin or are not better with maximum doses of metformin would be my area where i would push pyrotizone uh, fracture risk is also mentioned in pyrotizone in yeah, long, long term they do they do have increase in the uh, in that risk of fracture yes. okay okay uh, next slide please okay sir sorry dr merchant urinary bladder cancer i thought was negated but i don't remember i think uh, uh, yeah so it was negated so the issue I'm was more with the other pyoglitazone which was there rosiglitazone rosiglitazone and uh, and cv safety with rosiglitazone so rosiglitazone was banned and then came back now usa banned rosiglitazone every country in the world banned rosiglitazone and something happened in the us and usa has reintroduced rosiglitazone despite the cardiovascular safety profile but definitely the evidence that pyoglitazone has lesser cardiovascular morbidity than rosiglitazone or a substandard if, dose if you are going to quote me 7.5 mg uh, pyoglitazone has no role i don't know but i consider as a no the 7.5 mg still manufactured as a standalone pyoglitazone 7.5 mg combination has have been stopped but i am not uh, i have never used it and i don't use it and i don't approve it so it's too low dose to make low any dose. significant Uh, he's she's asking what about gfr reduction and pyoglitazone wouldn't wouldn't use pyoglitazone in renal failure is not the right choice although they they are not so very sure about the renal excretion of pyoglitazone i believe i mean they are going to have an issue it's uh, it's excreted through liver if i'm not mistaken but uh, in uh, renal failure we don't use pyoglitazone definitely uh yeah uh yeah we can take that lipaglin is a brand name of i forget the name saroglitazar saroglitazar is an indian uh, research molecule uh, supposed to be useful for both triglycerides and sugars i have never used it have you uh, i think the only place where we have used it patient who has very high triglyceride levels okay uh, so that's the only place uh, still a controversial drug although ada has incorporated it let's not go it's too controversial what has incorporated adeno ada ada has uh, incorporated last year huh? they Is have it? approved yeah. for uh, saloglitazone okay last year approved means it's not come in the guidelines but yes they have accepted the drug this okay. is the last i know but not been using it much alpha glucosidase inhibitors like a carbose miglitol voglibose three one three of those we use here uh, how, how is their use in your practice uh, so i think they are uh, they are not uh, let's say in common like is not very powerful anti diabetic so their action for um, uh, hyperglycemia um, countering hyperglycemia not so good we basically use in post prandial hyperglycemia you want to do a small correction if your fasting is about say 110 120 but pp is going towards 180 then probably uh, adding uh, uh, alpha glycosidase inhibitors are good that's one number two is that patient who are heavy eaters if you are anyway going to eat very less food there's no point in uh, adding the drug so if you're really heavy eater for consume lot amount of food during lunch or dinner then probably it works the the best you know so, so there's, uh, there's a very good point that uh, you should ask the patient which are his larger meals and instead of giving tds you can give it only with the larger meals if there are only two large meals for example and also recommendation is that you are supposed to start with a small dose and then you go on increasing so for example, gi side effects can be probably more because of lack of absorption of the disaccharide or polysaccharide and uh, the gi side effects of uh, are bloating chiefly the side effect is bloating so yeah. uh as we discussed in the last session i think hypoglycemia in a patient who's on multiple drugs including alpha glucosinol should be corrected with monosaccharide glucose not the disaccharide sucrose because sucrose has to be broken down to be absorbed and in the presence of alpha glucose it is inhibition it won't be broken down so give glucose powder so every patient should be instructed to keep glucose at home if they are on 
I'm talking about the Daisy repeaters. Uh, next slide, please. GLP-1 receptor agonists are injectable drugs, as you know. Liraglutide and dulaglutide are the two most commonly used. What is your use or experience of these? Uh, I, I don't use it much for a couple okay. of reasons. One is, of course, uh, the cost is a big barrier there. And the other thing is that uh, I think they, they would do well with obese patients, but uh, I'm not happy with that. Okay. I've used it in a couple of my patients, but uh, really no large amount of uh, benefit I could get. The other thing is that, of course, no, nausea, anorexia, and weight loss. That's how the drug works. So uh, that's part of it. But there was a big issue regarding, uh, uh, do you recommend uh, GLP-1 receptor agonist for only obesity? Or and only obesity. Only obesity was what was going on. But as of now, I don't think it's been approved only for obesity. Uh, I'm not a big proponent of GLP-1 receptor right. As you know, Liraglutide, brand name Victoza, and Dulaglutide, brand name Trulicity, as he said, they work via causing anorexia. And, uh, the, and Trulicity is, of course, once a week. Victoza is every day injectable. Uh, the principal problem is GI tolerance and uh, therefore not commonly used. One more problem that has been flagged is medullary thyroid carcinoma incidence increases. Uh, 30 milligram of Liraglutide has now been approved in the West. It has not come here for a st standalone obesity indication. Instead of, uh, even in patients who do not have diabetes, it has been approved in the West recently, but it has not come here. So I don't know whether it will come or will be approved here. Uh, anybody, any questions on GLP-1 agonists? So we, what he's asking is, as will they cause hypoglycemia if used no, for weight loss? No, the incidence of hypoglycemia is much is rare. Like it's like DPP4, the incidence of hypoglycemia is uncommon. The lady there, I'm I'm not aware. Even I'm not. <laughs> I'm not aware. Probably not. The only uh, drug where you have to monitor SGOTPT is supposed to be uh, the pioglitazone, but now. Recommendations even with pioglitazone are that the jo pehle wala glitazone tha na, rosy glitazone, mm. uska hepatic problems tha. Uh, sorry, there was one more glitazone which was withdrawn. Uh, some One glitazone had to be withdrawn because of hepatoxicity. Pioglitazone, they still recommend you do enzymes. But uh, that pioglitazone is excreted through the liver predominantly. So that's one reason why they want to monitor the enzymes. They want so to if monitor you have the enzymes. enzymes okay. are less, then you'll have an increase uh, levels of pioglitazone. Levels of Increase heart rate with liraglutide. Uh, I am not aware of it. Is there something, that, Dr. Subhash, that you have read? Okay. Uh, not to my knowledge. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, we are not discussing insulins in detail here, but still, uh, the hypoglycemia is something that I would like to discuss with you, especially. For the family physician, if they encounter hypoglycemia and a patient is at home and calls that sugar is 50, what do they do? Patient is on, say, whatever drugs. So, first, uh, I mean, all those patients who are diabetic on OHS or insulin, especially on insulin, we do need to counsel them regarding uh, the signs of symptoms of hypoglycemia. Uh, you also need to uh, counsel them about the food habits. So, if they are going to take insulin at night, uh, we sometimes recommend for these patients that they before they go to sleep. So if you have a dinner at about 8, 30, 9 and you are going to sleep at 9 o'clock, I mean so at 11 or 12 o'clock and you take an insulin at 9, then we sometimes tell them that you better take two Mahdi biscuits with a half cup of milk uh, uh, just before you go to sleep so that the chances of hypoglycemia are less. We also give them instructions that they need to keep some sugar uh, sachet with them at the bedside so that the first symptom of hypoglycemia, if they get there, uh, they should be consuming that. Uh, then also uh, to consider that patients who are on insulin and large number of oral diabetic agents, they have more larger incidence of hypoglycemic events. Also, they need to know that if they are consuming less food, then it is better that they either cut down the insulin dose or they can really omit the insulin dose. So, they, uh, counseling is what 
it's our job it's what we are paid for and it's our duty because most of the hypoglycemic events come because they do not know that this thing can happen then to recognize hypoglycemia is important a feeling of uneasiness would be the first symptom so all those patients may not have a florid you know tachycardia breathlessness or severe sweating or what you call that hunger so often an uneasiness is a, a, a very a very vague thing but these diabetic patients need to be if you feel uneasy then the first thing you would look for that you have a possibility that the sugars are low and then you just need not wait okay you just consume uh, the available sugar in any form uh, rather than you know wait let's see let's me see what's happening what's happening will take a call tomorrow but you need to consume some amount of sugar so as to prevent the about the episode of hypoglycemia so you know that diabetic patients long standing have a, di a what is known as hypoglycemic unawareness so we have to have them to look for the subtle signs there change in behavior uneasiness you need to counsel the relatives if the patient is behaving a little bit differently often they have altered sensorium they might look a little bit stoned so these subtle signs are something which we should educate them as well as their caregivers or as well as their relatives who are there so that we pick it up early counsel the patient there and you need to tell them what do they do when the sugar goes below 50 so probably you would want that if the sugar pure sugar form will be less because it's absorbed much faster than the complex carbohydrate so that's where but then anything which is available will be fine if it's not there but that's how we would want to give it report immediately to your doctor the another problem is that they feel a little bit low sugar they will consume sugar at night and go to sleep and this patient so suppose that at that time they have mo not monitored the sugar and the sugar was say around 80 patient has taken his insulin is anti diabetic sugar was probably 80 he consumes sugar okay or he has a, a tea with sugar etc and now he feels fine he goes to sleep and you find that the effect of that sugar because it's metabolized so fast so it will remain there for an hour or so and the patient will come back again with hypoglycemia so often this patient comes to us who come with florid hypoglycemia if you go back they will say that two days since two days i am feeling weak i am sleeping more i had one episode where i felt giddy so i consumed sugar and i was okay so they there were that history there that they had suffered hypoglycemia see our body actually has a good mechanism to prevent hypoglycemia so it will prevent as much as possible if we don't pick up those subtle signs then you go into a florid hypoglycemia uh that reminds me that next week next sunday uh, we are going going to give you a larger booklet than this one uh therefore a more taxing book to read which which will be on adverse drug reactions and we have several what we call one pages one pages are one page of information on different subjects and one of the subjects that we will tackle is hypoglycemia so uh, we'll talk about somogi effect don phenomenon hypoglycemia unawareness as he said pseudo hypoglycemia and maybe you will uh, know a little more information on that later on we have any slides for the suraj role of injectable glucagon in hypoglycemia yeah we patient first of all patient has to go to the hospital and glucagon is uh, available in tertiary hospital but not hospitals may be having that and uh, that's only if you have persistent hypoglycemia otherwise you can in inject dextrose that's what we do and that's fine with us so if you're uh, so we'll, i'll uh, just repeat their question on the mic because so i will i will i will repeat the question for the audience so what he's saying is that if you are we are aware that the basal insulins i have the least propensity for uh, hypoglycemia so he says that is it mandatory that you give mari biscuit to these patients who are on only basal insulin so couple of thing all those patients who are on insulin you also need to know that they are on metformin or often they are on some amount of oral hypoglycemic agent so although the insulin may be the culprit the the other drugs uh, actually have given more propensity for hypoglycemia so only basal insulin does not but if you see it's actually not basal it is basal bolus therapy so we need to be worried about it the other thing is that it's not that zero hypoglycemia right so every day if you are giving basal therapy for controlling and sugar time might come that if you have for some reason a increase accumulation so after 5 days 7 days you will have some increase in insulin level so ultimately you might 
go into hypoglycemia. But of course, the incidence propensity is much lesser as compared to any other incidence. We'll take one last question, sir. Ah. Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I said. So it's it's actually not so worried about the uh, insulin part if you're short acting. So the oral hypoglycemic agent often works for a longer period of time, and they are one more likely to give you hypoglycemic. Will. Sir, sir, So any OHA, any OHA, if you know that they will remain in body for some period of time. So it's not like uh, you correct it now and the patient is okay, as you rightly said. So what we do in practice is that uh, we are monitoring him very closely for at least 48 hours. And once the sugar persistently starts going more than 200, is the time we will say, okay, now we will, and of course the primary disorder of gastroenteritis or vomiting is controlled. Then only we'll think of starting the patients on OHA with a smaller dose. Hypoglycemia is a long topic and that's why uh, we are covering it in detail in our next, uh, in the booklet that we give you. It's a, because this is for the family physician very important to know everything that is there to know about hypoglycemia. Uh, I think we uh, thank Dr. Rahul Dambe for a thank very, you. very lucid uh, presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank uh, you. Dr. Tushar Maniya.